Final Girl is a solo-only horror game designed by Evan Derrick and AJ Porfirio and published by Van Ryder Games in 2021. In Final Girl, you are trying to take down a savage killer on the loose in a unique location as you play the final girl in your very own horror movie. During the game, you'll be playing action cards and making horror rolls to see how successful you are at the actions. As the horror level increases, you'll roll less dice, but don't worry because you can focus and bring the horror level back down to roll even more. Actions include moving around the map, trying to save victims to get bonuses, and eventually unlocking your final girl's ultimate ability, searching spaces for useful items and weapons, resting to heal yourself, and of course, attacking the killer. As you take actions, you'll use up time, and once you're done with your turn, you'll use the leftover time to buy new action cards for the next round. Then the killer will fight back by using his killer action and revealing a terror card. He will hunt down victims around the map, and every time he makes a kill, his bloodlust will increase, which makes his attacks stronger, increases his movement, and sometimes increases the horror level. Once the killer gains enough bloodlust, he will reveal his dark power, making him even deadlier and harder to kill. Play alternates between the final girl and the killer, with a terror card being revealed every killer turn. Once the terror deck runs out, the killer will reveal their dark finale, which will change his killer action to something very, very bad. The ultimate goal is to reduce the killer's health to zero with your attacks, but there's a surprise waiting at the end. The final health token must be flipped, and if it's blank, then the final girl wins. But if instead there are hearts on the health token, then the killer comes back to life in classic horror movie fashion. Kill him again and you win, but if the killer kills you first, then all is lost. But you too can make one last desperate attempt if your final health token isn't blank, so you never know how it's going to play out until the credits roll. Before you can play the game, you'll need the core box and one feature film. The core box has all the action cards, dice, tokens, and meeples that are used to play, along with the rule book and player board. Each feature film includes one killer and one location, along with the terror cards, tokens, and other items you'll need for that specific scenario. They also include two final girls each. There are a number of feature films available, but I'll be using Hans at Camp Happy Trails for this tutorial since it doesn't add any extra rules. Once you own multiple feature films, feel free to mix and match killers, locations, and final girls however you wish. To set up the game, you'll first want to take the feature film box and take off the magnetic sides. Check the bottom right corner for the killer's name, in this case Hans, and the reverse side of that lid will be the killer board. Similarly, the side that says the location, in this case Camp Happy Trails, will be the location board. Place them side by side on the table, and don't be afraid to bend the spines backwards so they lay flat. You won't damage the boards by doing so. Then take the player board out of the core box and put it below the killer board. You can really arrange these boards however you want to fit on your table, but this is the recommended setup. Next, choose your final girl. One side will have the ultimate ability, and the other side will have spaces for the victims you've saved. Place the victim side face up here. Now let's set up the health markers for the killer and final girl. The final girl's health is shown at the top here. Put that many health markers minus one on the player board here. For the final health marker, mix up the black tokens from the core box and choose one at random and place it here. It's very important that you don't look at the back side of this marker because when you lose your final health in the game, you'll flip it over and find out if you're really dead or if you come back to life. The killer's starting health is shown at the top left of the killer board here. Han starts with 12 health, so we'll place 11 hearts on his board here, along with one random black final health marker, just like we did for the final girl. The starting horror level is also shown on the killer board, so place a red meeple from the core box on that space of the horror track, in this case four. Also, put the hourglass marker on the sixth space of the time track. Let's finish setting up the killer board now. Take all the finale cards from the feature film box that show the upper part of the killer's body. Shuffle them and place one face down here. Note that you might have an epic finale card if you back the Kickstarter, and you can include that if you want or leave it out. They're pretty brutal, so I'd suggest leaving it in the box for your first few games. Next, take all the dark power cards that show the lower part of the body, shuffle them up, and place one face down here. Each film has one epic dark power that you can include if you want, but again, let's leave it out for our first few games. Lastly, take the bloodlust marker and put it at the very bottom of the killer's bloodlust track. Now it's time to build the terror deck. Both the killer and location will have terror cards with a symbol at the bottom right corner so you can separate them later. Hans's terror cards have a pig symbol and Camp Happy Trails have a tent. Shuffle all the terror cards together, deal out 10 face down, and set them somewhere easily reachable with room for a discard. 
The rest of the cards can go back in the box. Next, take all the action cards out of the core box and set aside the six cards with the golden zero time cost in the bottom right corner. This will be your starting hand. Then separate the remaining cards by name and cost and lay them out in piles off to the side. I sort them in order of cost with the cheapest two time cards at the bottom and the most expensive ones at the top. I also leave a blank space for the zero cost cards later in the game. Now let's set up the location. Take all the item cards, shuffle them, and make three piles of four cards above the location board. Flip the top card of each pile face up, and the rest of the item cards can go back in the box. Now shuffle all the green setup cards from the location box, place one face up here, and the rest back in the box. This is your starting setup for the game. This icon shows the starting position for the final girl, so place the pink meeple in that spot. And this K icon shows the killer's starting location, so put the red killer meeple in that spot. The numbers indicate how many victims are in each spot, so go around the board and put that many yellow meeples in each space. We're almost done with the setup. Last thing to do is shuffle all the blue event cards in the location box and place the deck to the right of the location board. Draw one and follow all the instructions on the card. Now we're ready to play, but just a reminder that other feature films might have special setup instructions, so if you're not playing Hans at Camp Happy Trails, you should read the additional rules and follow those instructions before playing. Final Girl is played over a series of rounds that are separated into the following phases. The action phase, which is the main player phase, the planning phase where you purchase new cards for the next round, the killer phase where the killer performs their special action and you draw a tarot card to find out what bad things happen to you next, the panic phase where victims might panic if someone has been killed that turn, and finally the upkeep phase where you can rearrange your items and the killer will reveal their finale if the tarot deck is empty. Let's go over the phases more in depth now. First is the action phase, which is the main player phase. You can use any items you've acquired and play action cards one at a time to move, search for items, attack the killer, and more. At the beginning of the game, you start with all the zero cost cards in your hand. I'll go over all the action cards later, but let's use the walk card as an example for now. Whenever you play an action card, you first need to make a horror roll to see what happens. The current horror level on the horror track determines how many dice you roll. At the start of the game we started at horror level 4, which means we roll 2 dice. All the white levels here will roll 2 dice. If you reduce the horror level to the green zone, then you'll get to roll 3 dice, and if the horror level increases to the red zone, you'll only get to roll 1. We don't want that to happen. You modify this by adding an extra die if the final girl or killer are down to their last health token, and there's a picture on the token to remind you. These bonuses stack, so if both characters are down to their final health, then you get two extra dice. If you ever decrease the horror level, and you're already at level zero, then instead gain one time. Similarly, if the horror level ever increases, and you're already at max, then increase Bloodlust by one instead. The Bloodlust track is here on the killer board, and we'll talk about Bloodlust later. First, let's look at the dice. The dice have two sides that are fails, two sides that are partial successes, and two sides that are full successes. Partial successes count as fails unless you discard two cards from your hand to turn them into successes. So you'll play a card, make a horror roll, and then check the card to see what happens. For walk, if you roll two successes, then you'll move up to two spaces and then lose one time. The time track starts each round at six, so just drop it to five. If you roll one success, then you can move up to one space and lose one time. If you don't roll any successes, then you have a choice. If you really want to move, then you can move up to one space, but you'll lose one health and two time, or you can not move at all and just lose two time. While we're on the subject of movement, let's take a closer look at the location board. There's a number of spaces and some of them are connected by a line like this, which means you can move between them. As an example, Makeout Point is connected to the cliffs, but it isn't connected to the cabins because there's no connection line. Also note that the lake is connected to both the dock and the cliffs, so you can swim across it. Don't worry about the numbers, those will be used later in the panic phase. The important thing to remember is that you can move between spaces as long as they are connected for one movement point. And you can even bring up to two victims with you to help them move around the board and get further away from the killer. Victims will not follow you into the killer's space, however, because that would be stupid. They don't want to die. But if there happens to be victims already in the killer's space, then you can move out of it and they will gladly follow. The green spaces around the board are exit spaces. Camp Happy Trails has three exit spaces. One here, here, and here. But other locations will be different. If you are in an exit space with victims, then you can save the victims for a bonus. Take the victim and place it on your final girl card, then gain the bonus on that space. If you place a victim here, you'll reduce the horror level by one. This one lets you gain two time, 
This one heals you for one heart. This one lets you take an action card that costs two or less. And this one lets you immediately move one space. Each final girl is different, but you can only gain each of these bonuses once. Once you've saved enough victims to fill all the spaces on your card, you'll immediately flip it over to reveal your ultimate ability. This ability is effective immediately and lasts for the rest of the game. If you rescue more victims, then you'll get the bonus down here, which for Lori gives you one time. A couple things to note about saving victims. It doesn't cost time and you can do it in the middle of moving around. So if we have two movement, we could move one, save these two victims, and then move a second time. Also, if the killer happens to be on an exit space with victims, you can still save them by moving into the same space. He doesn't prevent you from saving them. And it's worth pointing out that if a victim ends up in an exit space alone, without the final girl, then they aren't automatically saved. You'll have to go help them out. Now let's go back and talk about the rest of the zero cost action cards that you start the game with. We already went over walking, so let's look at focus next. Focus helps you reduce the horror track and hopefully get more dice for horror rolls. Two successes will reduce the horror level by one and also gets you two time. One success will still reduce the horror level by one, but cost you one time. And failure will cost you two time. Notice that failure doesn't mean nothing happens. You still have to check the card to see what happens. Next is short rest, which will help you heal. Two successes will heal two hearts, but you can't go above your starting health value. One success will heal one heart, but cost you one time. And failure will heal one heart, increase the horror level, cost you a time. And this symbol here means the action phase ends immediately. Normally the action phase ends when you choose to stop playing action cards or have none left in your hand, but this actually forces you to end the phase right now, which is probably not what you wanted, so be careful. The last starting card is weak attack, which lets you attack the killer as you might have guessed. You need to be in the same space as the killer to attempt a weak attack. Perform a horror roll as usual and check the results. Two successes means you do one damage as shown by this damage symbol. One success means you do one damage but also lose a heart. No successes means you lose a heart and the action phase immediately ends. Bummer. When you damage the killer, remove that many hearts from their killer board. So that's all the zero cost action cards. Your starting hand has two walks, two focus, one weak attack, and one short rest. You don't have to play them all. You can save cards in your hand for the next round or use them to convert partial successes. At any point before the action phase ends, you may also discard as many action cards as you wish in exchange for plus one time. There's a couple ways the action phase can end though. One way is that you fail on a horror roll and are forced to end it. Another way is when you run out of time and lose another time, as shown on the time track here. You can go to zero time and still play action cards, but if something forces you to spend time and you don't have any, then the action phase will end. The third way is that you run out of cards and have nothing more to play. You can still use items even when you run out of action cards, and I'll talk more about items in a minute. The final way for the action phase to end is that you choose to end it, even if you still have cards and time. Remember that before you end the action phase, you can choose to discard any cards in your hand to gain one time. Once the action phase is over, you move on to the planning phase where you get to use whatever amount of time you have left over to buy new action cards for the next round. The important thing to remember here is that you cannot buy any cards you just used in the last round, so keep them set aside in a discard pile for now. Any other cards in the action tableau are available for purchase, and the cost to purchase them is shown in the bottom right corner. There's no limit to the number of cards you can buy, but there is a hand limit of 10 cards. Check the time marker, and that's how much time you have to spend on cards. You can't overspend, and any time Time unspent does not carry over to the next round. As an example, if you have four time, you could buy two sprints, which costs two time each, or you could buy one retaliate, which costs four, or you could buy one search for two and two close calls for one each. Once you are done buying cards, then move the time marker back to six and return all cards you played last round to the tableau. Make sure to leave a space for the zero cost cards as they get used, and you can always take the zeros back, even if you have zero time to spend, as long as you stay under the hand limit of 10 cards. We've gone over all the zero zero cost action cards, so let's go over the rest of the cards in the action tableau in order from cheapest to most expensive. The only card that costs one time is Close Call, and it's actually the only one that doesn't require a horror roll. Instead, it lets you redo a horror roll for another card. After you play an action card and roll the dice, if you are unhappy with the result, then you can play Close Call and re-roll any one die for free, or re-roll all of your dice for the cost of two time. Whatever result you get after the re-roll is final, unless of course you have another Close Call to play. There's a few cards that cost two time to purchase in the tableau. The first is Sprint, which is a lot like Walk. Two successes lets you move up to three spaces for one time. One success lets you move up to two spaces for one time. And a fail lets you move up to one space, but you lose a heart, lose two time, and the action phase ends. Or you could just lose a heart and two time, but the phase won't end. 
The next card is Guard, and it's colored blue, which means it's a reaction card. You can't actually play this in the action phase. You can only play it in reaction to the killer attacking you in the killer phase. I'm going to skip this one for now, and we'll come back to it when I go over the killer phase in more detail later. The last card that costs two to purchase is Search, and this one lets you search a space on the location board for an item. The orange spaces on the board are called Search Spaces, and each one has a corresponding item deck that you set up at the beginning of the game. If you're in a search space, then you can play the search card and try to get one of these items. Two successes lets you take the top two items from the corresponding item deck, choose one to keep, and put the other one either face up on top or face down on the bottom. You also lose one time. One success lets you take the top item of the deck and lose one time. When the game starts, the top card of each item deck is face up, but after you take the top card, you don't flip over the new one, leave it face down. So let's talk about items real quick. If there's a hand symbol, then the item needs to go in one of your two hand slots here. And if there's no hand symbol, then you put it in your backpack. You can have two one-handed items in your hands, or you can have one two-handed item. Whenever you gain a new item, you can freely rearrange items between your backpack and your hand. So if you have a one-handed item and want to use your new two-handed item, then you can move your one-handed item to the backpack and equip the new one instead. Hand items that are in your backpack can't be used, but other items without hand symbols can be used anytime on your turn. The item cards tell you how to use them, and some of them are one-time use where you discard them afterwards. Some are also limited uses, like this trash can lid, and it'll have spaces to show how many uses are allowed. Place small wooden markers on these cards when you get them, and remove one every time you use it. Once all the markers are gone, discard the card. Weapons are special items that are used to attack the killer. They will have a range shown here, and a damage modifier shown here. A range of zero means you must be in the same space as the killer to use it. Unless the card says otherwise, weapons modify other attacks and add their damage modifier to the total damage dealt. This means they can't be used on their own to attack the killer. You need another attack card like weak attack to use it. So if you have the knife and play the weak attack card, you will do a total of two damage to the killer. One damage for the weak attack and one extra for the knife. But if you have the bow, then it specifically says it doesn't modify attack cards and instead you spend two time on your turn to use it. It's also got a range of one to two, which means you must be one to two spaces away from the killer. It automatically damages the killer. You don't have to make a horror roll, but after its uses are all used up, you have to discard it, unlike the knife, which you can use over and over again. All right, that explains item cards and how you use the search action. Let's continue with the rest of the cards in the tableau. For the rest of the cards, I'm not gonna explain every single thing that these cards do, but I'm gonna give you a general idea of what effect they have on the game. I think the cards are self-explanatory with the icons, and there's a nice icon reference on the back of the rule book. Distraction costs three to buy and lets you lower the horror level. Unlike the starting card Focus, this one can actually lower the horror level by two. Improvise also costs three and lets you automatically convert partial successes to full successes, which can be really handy to get ready for an important turn. Two successes on Improvise lets you convert all threes and fours for the rest of the action phase. But if you get only one success, then it only converts threes and fours on the next roll. Up until now, there's been two copies of all the action cards available for purchase, but everything that costs four or more only has one copy available. Planning costs four time and lets you add more dice to your next horror roll. Two successes lets you add three dice to your next horror roll, and one success lets you add two dice to your next horror roll. Retaliate costs four and is a blue reaction card just like Guard. We'll talk about this when I go over the killer phase next. Furious Strike costs four and it's a better version of Weak Attack. Two successes does two damage to the killer and lowers the horror level by one. Long Rest costs five and is a better version of Short Rest. On two successes, it lets you heal four hearts. Just remember that you can't ever go above your starting health shown on your final girl card here. And finally, the last action card is Critical Blow, and it costs six time to purchase. This is the biggest attack card in the game. Two successes does three damage to the killer and reduces the horror level by one. Just be careful because a fail does two damage to the killer, but also two damage to yourself and ends the action phase. All right, that's all the action cards available for purchase. It's a lot of options to take in at first, but because they don't change, you'll quickly learn what they do. Note that some feature films add new action cards to the game, like Sacred Groves, which adds two atonement cards. So after you've played action cards and bought new cards for the next round, the killer gets to wreak havoc in the killer phase, which is where all the gruesome events happen. In this phase, the killer will first perform their killer action, shown on the killer board here next to the red K symbol, and then you'll flip a tarot card and see what horrible things happen next. Han starts with this killer action, so let's break it down. 
The first symbol shows who he's targeting, and this symbol with both the final girl and yellow meeple means he will target whoever is closest, either the final girl or a victim. The second symbol is a knife, which means he will attack the target. So a couple things to notice here. First is that Hans isn't moving because then there would be a boot symbol like this. That means he's only attacking someone that's already in his space. But what if both the final girl and a victim are in his space? Who will he attack? Well, the killer will always attack victims first, so you'll be safe as long as a victim is with you. Otherwise, he'll attack the final girl. To find out how much damage he will do with his attack, you check this column on the killer's bloodlust track. At the start of the game, he'll do two damage, but as his bloodlust increases, his attacks will increase from two to three, four, and finally five at the very top. So Hans is going to attack the victim with a two power attack, but victims only have one health. So he kills the victim and the leftover damage just goes away. Even if there are two victims in his space, he's only going to kill one of them because he's only doing one attack. But if the action had two knife symbols like this one, then he would do two attacks and kill them both. After a victim is killed, you'll remove their meeple from the board, put it here, and then increase the bloodlust track by one for each victim killed. This blood splatter symbol here is to remind you to increase the bloodlust track, and it might show up in other areas of the game like tarot cards. As you increase the bloodlust track, you perform any actions on the far left column. If you see the hockey mask symbol, then increase the horror level by one, and if you hit this space which says dark power, then you reveal the dark power card and it takes effect immediately. If you're at the top of the bloodlust track, then you do the ability at the top every time bloodlust would increase. In this case, Hans will recover a heart and discard the next tarot card, moving you closer to revealing his finale. Just like the final girl, the killer can never recover more health than they started with, so he will only heal if you've damaged him. Also note that if there was an effect at the top of the track, you won't repeat it since you don't actually move the bloodless marker. You just do the special ability shown here. Let's go back to the killer action and go over the other targeting requirements you'll see in the game because these will show up on tarot cards too. We've already talked about this symbol, so let's do this one next. This means the killer will target the closest victim. If there's a tie for closest victim, then you choose the space with the most victims. If there's still a tie, then you get to choose. If he's targeting closest victim or final girl, and you're choosing the space with the most victims, note that the final girl does not count as a victim. The third targeting requirement is this one, which targets only the final girl. The boot symbol means the killer will move towards the target, and to find out the movement value, check this column on the bloodlust track. The killer will move that many spaces per boot icon, but when he reaches his target, he will stop. The knife icon means the killer attacks, and his damage value is shown on this column here. One thing that tripped me up when first learning this game is that the killer will move towards his target, but if he doesn't reach them, he will still attack the space where he stopped. For each knife icon, the killer will perform one attack, and he always targets victims first, unless the final girl was specifically indicated as the target. Here's an example where he's targeting victims. These groups of victims are the same distance away, so he'll target this group, which has more in the space. His movement is only one right now, so he moves one space closer to that group, but doesn't reach them. Now there's an attack icon, so he attacks his current space, which has the final girl in it. Oh no! When the killer attacks the final girl, he does damage equal to this column on the bloodlust track, and the final girl will remove that many hearts from her board. If the damage is enough to remove her last life, then flip her final health token over to see if she's dead. If it's blank, then the final girl dies and the game ends in a loss. If instead it shows hearts, then the final girl makes an unexpected comeback. Remove the black final health token from the game, replace it with a white one, which is always blank on the reverse side, and add a number of hearts to show her new health. So if you get lucky and reveal three hearts on the final health token, you'll place a white token and two hearts onto the health track. If there was any excess damage from the killer attack, then you simply ignore it. Whenever someone comes back to life, either the final girl or the killer, then the current phase immediately ends and you move on to the next phase. This is easy to forget, but crucial for giving you another chance at taking him down before his next attack. Now, if you ever take damage and have to remove your white health token, then you are truly dead and the game ends in a loss. You don't have to just take the killer's attacks though. There are some items like this trash can lid that can help you avoid being damaged. More importantly, there are two reaction cards in the action tableau that you can buy during the planning phase, and they give you a chance at avoiding damage and even attacking back. These reaction cards are blue, and you can only play them when you are being attacked by the killer. Just like the other action cards, you'll make a horror roll to determine the outcome. The guard card costs two time to purchase and can prevent all damage from a single attack if you roll two successes. If you only roll one success, you reduce the incoming damage by two, and no successes will reduce the damage by one. The retaliate card costs four time to purchase, and with two successes, it not only prevents all incoming damage, but it lets you attack back for two damage too. One success lets you reduce the damage by two and attack back for one, and nothing happens on a fail. 
This counts as an attack, so it can be modified by other cards like Lori's ultimate ability, weapons, and other items. Each reaction card can only be used against a single attack, so if the killer is attacking multiple times, then you'll need multiple reaction cards to deal with them. However, you can use multiple reaction cards against a single attack, one at a time if you want. It's also worth pointing out that reaction cards cannot prevent loss of life from this symbol found on tarot cards and action cards. Those are unavoidable. So after performing the killer action, at the start of the killer phase, you'll draw a tarot card and do whatever it says from top to bottom. A lot of the tarot cards have icons similar to the killer action, and you execute them in the same way. Other icons you'll see are the hockey mask, which increases the horror level by one, the event card symbol, which means you draw one event and do it immediately, a heart, which heals the killer, and this blood splatter, which increases the bloodlust track. All the symbols are conveniently located on the back of the core rule book. When you see this symbol, flip a new card from the event deck and do whatever it says. There are all sorts of events in the game and they all do something different. But if there's a colored meeple in the corner of the card, then you're going to introduce a special victim to the game. In this case, the closest victim becomes our boyfriend and we'll replace one of the yellow meeples with a blue one. Each event card tells you whether it stays in play or if there's a condition for discarding it. There is one other type of tarot card and that is the minor dark power. These go above the killer board and you place a heart on each space to increase his health, possibly above his starting health. For Hans, unholy speed adds one one to his movement every time he moves, and Unholy Rage adds one to his attack every time he attacks. If you damage the killer while these cards are in play, then you remove hearts from the minor dark powers first, and once the card is empty you discard it and the killer no longer has that ability. After you perform the killer action and draw a tarot card, the killer phase ends and you move to the panic phase. This one is pretty simple. If any victims died during the round, then all victims in the same space as the killer will panic and possibly run to an adjacent space. For each victim, roll one die and move them in the direction of whatever number you get. So if the killer and three victims are at the docks and someone was killed this turn, roll three dice and see where they move. On a one to four, they jump into the lake. On a five, they will move over here and on a six, they will move to this exit space. Just remember to use the numbers around the killer space, not the numbers in adjacent spaces. Some locations, like Makeout Point, can result in the victims staying in the same spot. On a three to a six, they'll panic and run for the cliffs, but on a one or two, they'll just stay at Makeout Point. I guess they're having too much fun and didn't notice Hans mercilessly killing their friends. The final step of the round is the upkeep phase. Usually there's nothing to do here, so after the panic phase you can just move back to the action phase and start your next turn. But if the terror deck is empty, meaning you just revealed the 10th terror card, then you must reveal the killer's finale by flipping it over on the killer board. This is never a good thing and the killer is going to get a lot harder from here on out, so you better hurry up and kill him. Also, if the dark power hasn't been revealed yet, then turn it over now. This is also the only time where you can rearrange items between your backpack and hands other than when you acquire a new item. Some other cards might indicate an upkeep effect that happens during the cleanup phase, so you'll do those now. That's the end of the round, so to recap you'll start a new action phase to play action cards and use items, then you'll buy new cards in the planning phase, then during the killer phase the killer will perform their killer action and draw a new tarot card, then if anyone died this turn the victims in the killer space will panic, and finally you'll rearrange items and reveal the finale if the tarot deck is empty in the upkeep phase. Rinse and repeat until the final showdown between you and the killer. You win as soon as you defeat the killer and you lose if you die. Remember that the killer also has a final health token, so the first time you kill him you'll flip it over to see if he's really dead. If you both happen to die at the same time then you are still victorious because you accomplished your goal even if it required the ultimate sacrifice. And that's how you play Final Girl. One cool thing about the Final Girls is that they each come with a special envelope inside the feature film that contains a unique weapon that's only for them. Most people save these items for after their first win with that Final Girl in the feature film that they came in. In future games where you play that Final Girl, you can include the special item by shuffling it into the item deck before you create your item stacks, and this creates uncertainty about whether the item will actually be in the game or not. If instead you want to guarantee the item is in the game, then deal out one less item card during setup add the special weapon in, and then create your item stacks. Similarly, each killer comes with an epic dark power card that is more difficult than the rest. I suggest that you leave this card out until you've beat the killer at least once. Then in future games you can add it in so there's a chance it comes up. If you back the Kickstarter, you'll also have a set of epic finales, and I would suggest the same for those. 
If you're wondering what sleeves I use for Final Girl, then check out the Amazon links in the description below. For the action and terror cards, I use the same sleeves I use for almost all of my board games, which are KMC Hyper Matte Clears. They have a textured back that's great for shuffling, but it slightly blurs the image. So for the Final Girl, Dark Power, and Finale cards, I use Dragon Shield Clear Classics. These let me see both sides of the card without blurring the image. Finally, for all the mini cards like the items, setup, and events, I use Arcane Tin Men small size that are non-glare. All right, and that's how you play Final Girl. If you made it to the end of this video, please consider giving this video a thumbs up so other people will be more likely to find it on YouTube. Now, when I first heard about this game, I was very hesitant because I had tried Hostage Negotiator early on in my solo gaming journey, and it just didn't click with me. But I have a soft spot in my heart for horror movies, even though I don't watch them much anymore. So I got the core box and the Happy Trails Horror feature film and decided to give it a try, and wow, I'm so glad I did. This game nails the theme in every way. The unique killers, locations, setup scenarios, event cards, tarot cards, just everything screams out horror movie. And it's interesting because I'm more of a Euro guy who likes a good theme just fine, but I don't really get immersed into the story of a game as it plays out. I mostly see games as a set of interlocking mechanics to score points. But holy cow, this game gripped me from the start, and I just get this visual story in my head of everything as I play it. The tarot cards kind of look boring and drab because they didn't have any art on them, but just the titles alone are enough for me to visualize what the card is doing as I step through the effect. It's really cool what they did there. Even the setup cards with titles like Skinny Dipping and Bonfire just instantly set the stage for what's about to play out. Now with all that said, you need to be ready for a brutally difficult game that can kill you off quickly while laughing in your face. Normally that'd be a pretty big turnoff for me, but the horror theme actually eases the sting of those losses and prepares you for a really hard game before you even start. And it's pretty quick to just reset everything and try again, so I'm okay with the losses. It doesn't make the journey any less satisfying for me. I still played a mini horror movie in my head for 30 minutes and had fun. But if you don't like the idea of rolling dice for horror checks for every single action, then this probably isn't for you. That is the single biggest criticism I see every time this game is talked about, and it's true. The dice are unforgiving and can totally screw up your perfect plan. The tarot deck is also very random, and sometimes you draw something that does effectively nothing, which is a big help for the final girl, and other times you draw the worst card ever and the killer just goes on a rampage slaughtering people everywhere. That's what you're signing up for here, and I love it. As for replayability, I'd say it's okay with one or two feature films, but after a dozen plays of each, you will have basically seen everything. It's really the random combination of starting setup and events, along with how the tarot deck plays out that will keep you guessing. But the more feature films you own, own, then the more combinations you will be able to mix and match different killers at different locations, and some of them are just so dang cool, like taking Hans to Maple Lane for more of a Michael Myers Halloween vibe. It's also worth mentioning that every other feature film besides Camp Happy Trails has its own set of special rules and setup instructions, so there is a learning curve there. But they shake the game up, and I'd say the extra rules are worth it for the payoff and theme and making each film feel unique. All in all, this shot up over the past year to my number two solo game of all time, and I'm pretty confident that the season two content will make sure it stays there for a while. So that's it for me. Let me know in the comments what you think of Final Girl and what your favorite feature film or killer and location combo is. Also, would you be interested in separate shorter videos that explain the special rules of the other feature films? If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to me on YouTube. If you want to check out more of my videos, then click the links on the screen and maybe you'll find a new game to play. And with that, Michael Skeleton is out.